Okay, so the Rambam um, in Hilchot Shuba says that Yom Kippur forgives sins between um, between Makom Hashem between people and Hashem, but it doesn't forgive um, the sins between people and people, and so. Um, to achieve that forgiveness, we have to go to the people and ask forgiveness and make restitution um, from this individual, our friend, or whoever this individual is. So I publicly want to ask Mechila to, and everyone here, I'm very sorry if um, I let you down this year, if I did something specific. Um, I'm trying my best, but best isn't usually good enough. So um, if you would like to to talk things out with me or whatever, please let's do it later after the um, after the um, the Zoom. You can get in touch with me, but I do want to ask forgiveness from everyone. Um, if I hurt anybody, I certainly never meant to. Okay, so tonight, some things I'm going to present to you. I'm going to present you different things I read and learned, and some of them might not even seem like they're in sync with each other. Do you want? Is, should I change? Um, can you see me okay or whatever? Yeah. Okay. Um, so they might not seem in sync with each other, and but there's so many different approaches to the Torah. So I'm going to present these because I thought they were all worthy of presentation, even though there's a gazillion more things I could have presented. Um, I want to dedicate this short program to all of the heroes throughout history who have um, risked so much, including... Um, some risked their lives to fast on Yom Kippur. Some lost their lives to fast on Yom Kippur. Um, whether it be in the former Soviet Union or in concentration camps or elsewhere. I have read so many inspirational stories and millions more can be told. Uh, never were told by the Jewish people who risked their lives. So to those who are still alive, may they still go from strength to strength. And for those who perished then or since then, May their aliyahs have a nish may their nishamas have an aliyah. So um, I will. Um, I'm Thank giving you no original ideas. Everything I'm giving you is from things that I've read from different sources. And you can you please feel free to correct me if you hear a mistake. <coughs> um, but if you have a question, please reach out to me later, and I will try to get an answer for you. So I'll take questions like only at the ends, and I might have to you know, get you an answer from somewhere else. So I just want to start. Serena, would, would you like us all to mute until we- Yes, if everyone would please mute, mute, that would be great. If not, I'll mute you all. Okay, I'm going to mute everyone. Um, but you can all unmute yourselves when you need to. Okay, so I'm going to start with, um, and I am going to quote things from this Hamiz Rafi magazine. I can get you there at the shul on the ledge, but I'm happy to get you a copy and bring it to you if you'd like. Um, I find it fascinating. It comes out like seven times a year by every different holiday and um, for the last few years. So the, and like this, one of the people who writes in here, I love her name is Sivan Rachav Meir. She, she bills herself as a Balachuba. She became observant in her teens. Um, and she's a very, very, very popular um, journalist in Israel. So um, she and her husband, wrote the, Yedidia Meir, wrote the following. Have you imagined yourself on Rosh Hashanah next year? Many explain that this is precisely what should be done on Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah, our focus is not primarily on looking backwards, but mostly on looking forward to the year ahead. We must try to clarify what we want from ourselves on all levels. And I thought that was sort of a nice way to begin. Um, another person who often has articles in here is, let me get his, his article, Rabbi, Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis from, um, from England. He is, he's the chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth and serves as president of Mizrahi UK. Um, he's also very interesting. And though this is what he writes about. 
The Israeli psychologist and Nobel laureate, Professor Daniel Kahneman, points out that negative experiences loom larger and feel more intense than positive experiences. However, he maintains that it is possible to train ourselves to take better control of how our minds process these happenings. We can derive inspiration from the Torah account of creation. And there was evening and there was morning. Vahi Erev, Vahi Boker. Morning always follow, follows evening. Darkness always gives, give, always gives way to light. Recognition of the fact that adversity will always be followed by deliverance helps us understand hardship and see that just as, there, just as there is a certainty about night and day, adversity can be an unavoid, unavoidable and necessary part of what it is to be human. Boy, how we all feel that right now. We've been feeling it for the last 18 months, um, the darkness and the, the um, looming exper experiences and everything like that. But morning always follows evening. Sometimes it's a little tricky. We thought we had morning a little more this summer. Um, so, but it's going to be. Darkness is going to give way to light and, um, and things are going to get better. So I hope that, I hope that helps everyone, including myself. Um, from there, I'm going to go to also to my friend Sivan with something that she says, not directly um, having to do with uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but I thought it was really worthy to mention. So she said, not if, but how. Um, her niece celebrated her bat mitzvah, and I guess um, Sivan, being the journalist and speaker that she is, it sounds like she gave a speech at the bat mitzvah, and um, she said, she said to Roni that it's not a question of if you will keep the mitzvot, but how will you, how you will keep them. It's clear that you will go hear the blowing of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. We're not living in a, in a land where you had to walk kilometers through the snow in order to hear the shofar, or we had to hide from the communists to hear it. Today, we are privileged to live otherwise and keep all mitzvot we desire. Our concern is not about if we will hear the shofar, but how we will hear it. Will we get excited? Will we experience renewal? Will we understand the significance of the shofar's siren sound? It's not about if you will do what your parents ask, but how you will do it. It's not about if you will pray and keep Shabbat, but how. It's not about if you will learn Torah, but how. In other words, the question is not about what you are doing, but whether you are doing it with enthusiasm. And then, I mean, that's not applicable to everyone, but in this case, it is for her niece. But I really like what she says in the next paragraph. She says, in short, life is not a series of technical instructions that need to be checked off. The mitzvot you accept about, upon reaching the age of 12 are not a dry list of operating directives. The purpose of life, after all, is to bring our heart and soul into everything we do. Also, a really, really powerful message right now. Okay. Um, the next thing I read was a very interesting article by a rabbi named Rav Ruvain Luchter in the Mishvacha magazine of this week. I have no idea. This is not a picture of him. This is just the Mishvacha magazine. I don't have a clue of who he is. I guess maybe I should. And I just dropped a piece of paper over there. Um, maybe I should know who he is, but um, I don't, but I, I really like what he said here. So here we go. But on Yom Kippur, the day itself changes us. The Gemara brings an opinion uh, that Yom Kippur atones for our transgressions, even without doing Teshuvah. The consensus is, of course, that we need to do Teshuvah, but we don't need to do it all ourselves. Yom Kippur isn't just a walking stick to help us trudge the long road to atonement. Yom Kippur is the train that takes us there. All we need to do is pay the fare through tshuva and tefillah. And I'll have another reading that sort of supports this um, idea also. The unique power of Yom Kippur is called Itsumo Shel Yom. It cleanses us and transforms us. 
That's why so many of the Gedolim, <coughs> the great rabbis, are calm and joyous on Yom Kippur. The whole year we struggle to set ourselves back on track. On Yom Kippur, we get a helping hand. How could we not rejoice at such a life-changing gift? Yom Kippur is a glimpse of another reality, a visit to a higher world. Yom Kippur is a day when we rise above our natural limitations and experience a closeness to Hashem that's normally reserved for the angels. Again, that's a theme that we think of on Yom Kippur, that we're like angels, like Malachim. The prohibitions of the day aren't just afflictions, they reflect the higher reality of the day. The whole year, we are anchored to the body's demands. But on Yom Kippur, we're like Malachim, like angels. When you're so close to Hashem, eating and drinking are inconceivable. On Yom Kippur, we rise above our physical desires. We break free from our slavery to the body and make Hashem our master in its stead. Then from that new vantage point, we see the disgrace of our Averot, our sins, and wonder how we were foolish enough to do them. We distance themselves from them and vow to live differently not just because we know we're supposed to, because finally we really want to. Okay, so I think that's a very, very interesting perspective um, that really speaks to me. It really, really speaks to me. Okay. Um, I found a few interesting quotes on Aish, very accessible and very easy for everyone to get on the internet. One was a midrash on Shir Hashirim on Song of Songs. And it, the quote is, open for me an opening the size of, of a needle and I will expand it into a door through which wagons can go through. So change is not all or nothing. God tells us that we just need to take that first step, however small it may be, and he will show us a way forward. That's also something very, very helpful and comforting. Um, okay, and the second quote that I that really I thought was worthy of, of saying right now was from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. If you believe breaking is possible, believe fixing is possible. We don't need to cover up or deny our mistakes. We fall. Our lives can sometimes feel broken. We need to remember to focus on fixing the brokenness instead of allowing it to lead to hopelessness. Um, I could send it if anybody's interested in it. It can be found right on, um, on h.com as well. And then the next, article, which I wanted to bring to your attention, but give me a minute as I'm busy with my papers here, is from Rabbi Beryl Wine. Um, for those who like Chicago history, Rabbi Beryl Wine's father, Rabbi Zev Wine, was the rabbi of Kesemara when it was in East Rogers Park. And I believe before it came to East Rogers Park too, but for 30 something years, Rabbi Zev Wine was the um, rabbi of Kesemarov. And this is from his very famous son, Rabbi Beryl Wine. Uh, it's an article from Ahamas Rachi, but not this year's. I found it online from a different, it's from, I'm not sure what year it was from. Um, and it's called The Day of Great Opportunity. And this is in the middle of the article. As mentioned above, Yom Kippur is a singular day of opportunity, freed from the mundane tasks that encompass our existence all year long. We have time to think about what ultimately matters in life. <coughs> Excuse me. Family, community, tradition, and our legacy to those that come after us. We honestly confront our mortality and human state of being. We also think about our souls that we have oftentimes ignored and neglected because of the pressures of our daily pursuits. 
we can recharge that reservoir of Jewish pride that lies within each of us. How special we are as individuals and as a collective nation. Identifying as a Jew and understanding the demands and privileges that this identity bestows, everyone um, gives one a true sense of importance and purpose in life. The alienated, the scoffers, the confused and the ignorant will find little comfort for themselves on this holy day. But for those who seek to know themselves and thereby glimpse their creator and their own immortality, the day of Yom Kippur is one of unmatched opportunity and wrenching satisfaction. Okay, so those that pretty uh, interesting words. Yom Kippur is one of unmatched opportunity and wrenching sat satisfaction. It is akin to the renewal of an old and cherished friendship and a finding a long lost object of emotional value. Our inner essence uncovered by the holiness of the day of Yom Kippur is that long lost valuable object. It is our old and best friend. Okay. Um, okay, somebody asked, what's the name of the article on h.com? It was 10 inspiring quotes for 10 days of repentance. That was, um, and it's from five years ago, 10 inspiring quotes for 10 days of repentance. Um, okay, so that's from Rabbi Wine. And then, again, thank you for bearing with me because I have to use some things over and over again. Okay, I really, 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 am I saying really enough times? Um, liked an article by Johannes and Rosenblum in this week's Mishpacha magazine. For those of you who haven't heard of Johannes and Rosenblum, Jonathan Rosenblum, he is from Highland Park. Um, he, I believe he, he's from a family of five brothers. I believe four of them became observant. The family's very, was always very, um, traditionally inclined, but they became, um, uh, very observant. And, um, I mean, I could tell you more about the family, but, um, he's a great writer and speaker. And I'm sure some of you have heard of him, Jonathan Rosenblum. Anyway, he wrote an article, great article. Sometimes I don't even understand his articles because he is so like brilliant that they're just way above me. But this one, I did understand. Um, okay, so he says in the middle of his article, it is not enough to recognize that Hashem is always present. The central message, and I just love this, of Elul and of the 10 days of repentance is that God is on our team. He is on our team. He has come down from his throne to make it easier for us to form a relationship with him. Then he says both Rabbi Cohn and Rabbi Bernstein, and I didn't know who they are. It's Rabbi Emmanuel Bernstein, who wrote a book called um, Teshuva. And a Rabbi Kohn, Rabbi David Kohn, a very nice Jewish name, who's Rosh Yeshiva Hebron. He's the head of uh, the Hebron Yeshiva in Israel. Um, both Rav Kohn and Rabbi Bernstein offer hints as to how we can take advantage of this opportunity. This opportunity we're talking about that Hashem has, is on our team, okay? He's come down from his throne to make it easier for us to form this relationship, and he's on our team. Um, in his discussion of tefillah, of prayer, Rav Kohn cites the opinion of Reb Chaim Brisker that one has not fulfilled his mitzvah of tefillah, of davening, if he did not have in mind that his davening takes place standing in the presence of the king of kings. It matters not that some of the other Achronim rabbis argue with Reb Chaim's psaq, no one contests that it is contests that it is the optimal way to daven. So the optimal way to daven is if we understand that we're standing before the King of Kings. And it is indeed a paradigm shift from that one recognition, everything else follows. If we understand that we're before the King of Kings, everything else follows. What follows? The way we stand, 
the way we focus on the words, and yes, our eagerness to avail ourselves of the opportunity to cast our needs upon Hashem. Um, the paradigm shift with respect to mitzvahs is to view them as gifts from Hashem to allow us to connect to him. The word mitzvah, and I think I think I have something else that um, Rachav, um, Sivan also talks about this. The word mitzvah itself is from a root indicating joinder or connection. The negative of that view of mitzvahs is an approach to mitzvahs that it has an arbitrary set of obligations, a sort of checklist to be gotten through so we can get on with what we're really, what we really want to do, okay? But the word mitzvah itself, itself comes from a root to connect. We are connecting to God through our mitzvahs. But I just love how he literally, I mean, they even highlighted this um, they highlighted it in the article. They said, it is not enough to recognize that Hashem is always present. The central message of Elul and the 10 days of repentance is that he is on our team. Okay, I thought that that was really, really great. Um, so certain things that are in the Yom Kippur Davani, like the al that we clap on our, on our hearts, um, before the ending of Shemona Esrei, uh, four times during um, Yom Kippur, I don't believe we do it in the Elah at the end, but I believe it's done uh, the first night at Marav, and then Shachri, Musaf, Mincha on Yom Kippur day. Um, it's individual, as individuals, we cry for forgiveness, that we did this, that we did this, we did that, before ending Shemona Esrei, but then when the Chazim repeats the Shemona Esrei in Chazarat Hashatz, we say them in the middle of Shemona Esrei and we sing together. Al Kulam, you know, we, we have this song that we're singing together. So what's that all about? So um, as a kihila, this, this um, Rav Yashabir Salavechik talks about this as a lot. Um, it's the power of unity when we're repeating Shemona Esrei and we're all together, we can even demand forgiveness from Hashem. And we feel, we feel the power of being able to do that. I know um, my husband talked about it yesterday in his speech. Um, and he said that um, how it talks, it, it means, it talks about the power of unity, about what we can accomplish when we're together. He said, not conformity, but unity. So um, that's another nice idea to think about. Um, the next one that I wanted to mention um, is really interesting. Um, comes again from this Mizrahi magazine from a woman named Tova Levine. And let me get her article out. She, she's talking about Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. We're always busy. We love to sing it. Everyone comes together and it's very powerful. So she says something very interesting. She talks about, and this is like a little different than, than, than we've been talking about. She says that um, it's very hard to get past the imagery of a human king. Okay, when we think of a king, we think of a king. She says, we think about a human king, a celebrity king, um, sometimes Queen Elizabeth. And these kind of kings, we can only really look at them from the outside looking in. Um, she says, just to get backstage passes once in a while is an empty rela relationship with no reciprocity. So she says, let's try to get past the imagery of a human king of flesh and blood and a celebrity king where there is no building of a true relationship and hopefully relate to Hashem as our beloved king or as our personal father king. Avinu Malkeinu, our father king. Let's try to connect with the true meaning of Avinu Malkeinu. And she, um, it's, it's a... I mean, to me, it was like a very different idea. 
because I am that type of person that when I hear the name King, I think of King David, I think of King, and yes, Hashem is the King of Kings, Melech, Malchei, Melachim, the King of all Kings, Hashem Melech, Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimloch, Lilam Ba'ed. He was King, he is King, he will be King. I'm always thinking that on Yom Kippur and on Rosh Hashanah. But it was very interesting idea of to think of him as our beloved King or as our personal Father King. Interesting idea that needs a lot of thought. Um, okay, so this is something that is like a revolutionary perspective for me. And actually the rabbi who wrote about it used the words, it's a revolutionary perspective. So this is by Rabbi Moshe Tirigan. It's called the Human Gates of Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah is the last service when the gates are closing, like last chance type of thing. Um, and what he said is so, I mean, to me, absolutely so fascinating. Let me just get to the right place on this. Um, traditionally, uh, and he's quoting, I'm sorry, his name is Rabbi Moshe Tirigan, but he's talking, uh, he's quoting something that a uh, Rabbi Yehuda Amital related in this revolutionary perspective. He starts talking about Shir Hashirim, the relationship between man and a woman, which is correlated to this, the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people. And from there, he gets to the following. Tradi but I, I, I just can't go through the whole thing. Um, traditionally, and this is what I believe we all believe, Ni'ila is understood as our attempt to keep the doors of heaven open, to allow our tefillot to ascend. In this midrash, however, the door we are trying to open is not the door of heaven, potentially blocking our to be loud, our prayers. It is the door that separates man from woman, the door that separates Hashem from his people, and the door between Hashem and our own heart. This is the door that we have tried to open throughout all Yom Kippur, and hopefully we can pry open during the Elah. That door is not the gate of heaven, but rather the gate of the human heart, the only gate whose key Hashem does not possess. For God to enter and create that rendezvous, a human, must be, a human being must let God in. The goal of Ne'ilah is not to look towards heaven to try to halt the closing of the gates of Tefillah. It is time of internalization, of looking into our own hearts, of trying to open our hearts to allow Hashem to enter. The Midrash teaches us that the true drama of Yom Kippur is not whether our tefillot will or will not be accepted, but whether we will become one with Hashem. Hashem is trying to open the door. He's on the other side of the entrance of the human heart, trying to enter. He's our ally. He's cooperating. Will a rendezvous occur? This is the drama of Ni'ila. It is our attempt to pry, to pry open the gates of the human heart and ha allow Hashem to enter. And then he ends by saying, may we open the door and let Hashem into our hearts. And I just want to finish, again, totally a different idea than I'm, than I'm used to, um, but interesting, very interesting. And the last thing that I totally recommend is Tversky. And the Mahsur, this is the Yom Kippur one. There was also one for Rosh Hashanah. Um, excellent by Rabbi Abraham J. Torsky, who only recently passed away. I think he wrote 90 books or something, something incredible. Um, and when he talks about Ne'ilah, he talks about um, his experiences in medical school. And, and that's what he talks about here. Um, he says the word Ne'ilah means closure and the tefillah, the prayer of Ne'ilah is the closing prayer of Yom Kippur. And it's also gonna be my closing for this evening. Um, one of the few team of Ne'ilah is open the heavenly gates for us at this time when the gate closes for the day is fading away. And he says that, um, he took a class in the second year of medical school, a pathology class. And he says, if you muff pathology, you might as well pack your bags and go home. And it was a no-nonsense professor. You had to be there by eight in the morning. 
at which time the doors to the lecture room were closed. And once they were closed, that was it. No amount of pleading made any difference. If you were caught in traffic and arrived at 801, you missed the lecture. And he says, you can imagine the scene of the student who's running, rushing into the building and sees the door being closed. He makes a mad dash and shouts at the top of his lungs, don't close the door, I'm here. If his plea is heard and he is allowed entrance, he is eternally grateful. In one more moment, the door will be locked and his dreams of becoming a physician are in jeopardy. So that he, I mean, that's a really great um, comparison in a way to how we, how our hearts are feeling as Naila is going on and the gates are about to close. Um, okay, so then he wrote, in the second year of medical school, the pathology year, Rosh Hashanah fell on Monday and Tuesday, Yom Kippur on Wednesday, Sukkot twice on Monday and, and Tuesday. I was going to miss seven days of pathology lectures. Some of the students said, if I, I did not attend those lectures, my aspirations to become a physician were over. I was aware of the holiday schedule well in advance. During the two months of summer vacation, I studied the pathology textbooks to the point of virtually knowing them by heart. I did not attend classes on Yom Tov, but because I was so well prepared, I ended up with the highest grade in the class. So, and so this is the comparison that Rabbi Torsky makes. If we are wise, we prepare ourselves well with sincere teshuva during the entire month of Elul and during the 10 days of repentance so that when that we see the doors closing at Ni'ilah, we do not panic, okay? So it shouldn't be a panic feeling if we're prepared properly. So, um, so it's my wish that everyone's um, tefillot should be answered. Um, everyone should have good health in the coming year, and we should see um, we should see lots of happy things, uh, things that we might have felt were missing the last year and a half, and um, hopefully we'll get to be together more. Um, and uh, it should be a year of bracha, a year of blessings for all, Klal Yisrael, and shalom in Israel, peace in Israel. Baruch tova to everyone. I, um, everyone can unmute themselves. And thank to you. Okay, thank Sarada. you. Thank, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Those were so thank great. you, Sarada. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I just want to say Julie Rosenheim wrote in the um, chat that her family lived next door to um, yeah, the Rosenblums. To the Rosenblums in Highland Park. Yes. And um, okay. actually, uh, my husband was really good friends with Jonathan Rosenblum. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So yeah. Actually, we even saw him like a few years ago, you know, but um, yeah, he's a really nice guy. Yeah. I, I know his brother Max very well. Oh, okay. He's younger. He's he's younger than him. So, wow. Yeah, yeah Max. Okay, neat. I remember them all. Sure. Wow. Yeah, you never know who your next door neighbors I are know. or who they might become. It's so fun. Thank you. That was yeah. so all so inspiring. Yeah. Okay, I hope so. Yes. It's so good to see so many people. Thank, Thank you. you for this opportunity to be able to see everybody. Yeah, right. Yes. Right. God willing, we'll have more. Um, so. Can you just repeat the name of the I'm sorry. The, the name of what? Um, the book um, uh, from Tversky. Yes, it's called Tversky and Mahsor. Tversky okay. and Mahsor. And it's okay. this one is Yom Kippur. Okay, thank There's you. Also one for Rosh Hashanah. You're welcome. He's very inspiring. So Shana Tova. Shana Tova to everyone. Thank Take you. care. Thank Be well. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Miss you. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Take care, Mufusa. I'm going to listen again, Soretta. It's just fantastic. Really helpful. Okay, good, good. I'm glad it was helpful. Yep. I'm glad. Soretta? Yeah. Hi. So when you started at the beginning and you said about how we hope to see next Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Cohn spoke about that. Why is it in the Avino Marcanus 
that we should be put in the book of Zechuyos? What do you mean put us in good deeds? If we haven't done our good deeds yet, why do we go into our good deeds? Because we should always be looking forward. Sign me up, give me an opportunity, and I will do it. So right away, you connected with me when you brought okay. that in. Great. Thank you. Thanks for there sharing. There were a lot. And, and the H.com took it down. Absolutely amazing. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. You're All welcome. Right. Thanks for your I'm help tonight. Take care. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Be well. Be well. Bye-bye. Everyone be well.